Thank you, Mark. So the uh, character study I chose was Daniel 3, and specifically Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or uh, as my dad always called it gro growing up, Shadrach, Meshach, and a billy goat. That's what he would always call it. Uh, and uh, Ryan actually sent me a picture uh, a couple weeks ago. I think he was on vacation, and he saw a picture of, uh, it was a coffee shop called Shadrach, Meshach, and a bean to go. So uh, I, poor Abednego is just always getting made fun of. So um, throughout this lesson, I'll probably refer to these three uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as the three friends, because it's a lot to say constantly. So, um, But before we dive into uh, Daniel 3, um, there's some questions I would like us to be thinking about as we do read through this. Um, and number one is, what idols do we struggle with in our world today, even in our own personal lives? Um, number two is, how does what happened in Daniel 3 apply to our lives today? And I want us, want us to be thinking about our jobs, our personal lives, our homes, societal expectations, things like that. Um, I also want us to be thinking about how uh, do Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how do they react to the king's request in chapter 3? And how does their reaction apply to us today as Christians? Next, I would like us to be thinking about if we react to persecution like uh, the three friends do, what message does this send to the world, and how could this affect non-believers? And last, one of the more important ones, I think, is what example do we see in our world today that are similar to what the king demands in Daniel chapter 3? So if we could just be thinking about those things as we go through uh, Daniel chapter 3, I think that would be good. Um, leading up to Daniel chapter 3, though, I think it would be good for us um, to just hit some highlights of chapter 1 and 2. Uh, just because there's some key items in, in there that I think will help us understand Daniel chapter 3. So in chapter 1, we see that Daniel and his friends are actually taken from Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And uh, the king at this point in time is doing that with a lot of different countries, a lot of different nations. And he essentially takes them as hostages to indoctrinate them into their society. And so the king's only taken the best of the people, right? The smartest, the best looking the most strategic, the most skillful people to Jerusalem. And Daniel happens to be in that group along with his friends. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are in that group. And so when they arrive in Babylon, Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah's names were immediately all changed by the king. And so that was kind of step one in the indoctrination. And so Hananiah, his name was changed to Shadrach, which means illuminated by the sun god. Mishael was changed to Meshach, which means like the Babylonian god Venus. And then next we see Azariah's name is changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nego or god of fire. And so we immediately see that in chapter 1 that Daniel and his friends are trying to, eat the, they're trying to get them to eat the same food as them. They're trying to get them to worship the same god as them, talk the way they do. They're trying to get them to change their names. And so we see this immediate indoctrination into their cultural by simple small steps. And so I think that's something we can relate to because it's not always one big thing. It's simple small steps along the way that add up. And so next in chapter 2 we see that King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he doesn't like this dream. He's confused by it. He wants an interpretation of this dream. So he brings all his best people, right? The magicians, the sorcerers, and he asks them to interpret this, but he can't. And so he's pretty mad about it and he wants them all put to death. And so guess who he tasks with that? Daniel and his friends. He wants them to do the dirty work. And he asks them to kill all of the wise men who could not interpret the dreams. And so Daniel kind of steps in, sets an appointment with the king, and says, hey, let me try and interpret these dreams, and God helps him interpret those dreams. And so kind of where I'd like to start off tonight is at the end of chapter 2, because I think it's very interesting what the king has to say. So if we could go to Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 46. And if I could get a reader for Daniel 2, 46 through 49. That's Daniel 2, 46 through 49. Daniel made 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained at the king's court. Thank you. So we see at the end of chapter 2, it's kind of interesting how the king reacts. You know, he's obviously happy at this point. Someone has interpreted his dream. And at the end of chapter 2, Daniel and his friends kind of have it good, right? Um, he and his friends are now relatively important within the society and respected by the king. And so Daniel even holds a high position in the king's court. And so what's interesting to me is at the end, the king even goes as far to say that Daniel's God is the true God. He is the God of God and Lord of kings. And then given this info, I think it's interesting to see how chapter 3 plays out. And so now that we're caught up to this point, I'd like to go ahead and read uh, Daniel 3. If I could get two readers for Daniel 3, we could do verse 1 through 15 and then 16 through 30. So that's 1 through 15 and 16 through 30. So if I could get the first reader to go with 1 through 15, please. Thank you. I get a reader for 16 through 30 now, please.
Thank you. Any initial thoughts or comments by anyone about that? It's kind of an interesting chapter. King kind of seems a little bipolar here from the beginning to the end, but any initial thoughts? That's a great point. Anybody else? That's a great point. That's a great point. <clears throat> yeah, and so after reading this chapter, kind of had a funny story to go along with it. So it reminded me of an actual time that I dealt with an actual fire. Um, so as many of you know here, a lot of the guys here are like smoking, right? Not that kind of smoking, but smoking meat. And so we, so much so, we even have a text message group called the Smoking Club. And <laughs> Mark's kind of the king of that. He's, he's good at smoking. But, you know, <laughs> a few years ago, um, I had got a pellet grill, right, for Christmas, and my dad put it out on the front porch. And um, I had smoked a few things on it beforehand, you know, some, some briskets and things like that. But this time I was going to, I would messed the briskets up every time, right? So this time I was going to do it right. So got it all seasoned up, put it in there, put it at 225, nice, low, and slow, right? So... I put the probe in there, and it's, it's kind of like a, a Bluetooth probe, so it sends all the temperatures throughout the cook to my phone, you know. And so it's going, going, and um, three or four hours in, I look at the, you know, the alarm's going off. It's like 500 degrees, and that's not low and slow. And so I go out there, and I open it. It's just like flames in my face, like singeing my, my face off. And um, so, you know, I shut it down, and I get some water, and I'm throwing it on it. That doesn't work, so I go get the water hose. You know, I'm spraying out, finally get it out. And so I got lucky. It was a grease fire. Apparently, you're supposed to clean the grease out every time. But so, but the ne I think it was that evening or maybe the next day, I was looking under the sink or looking in the pantry, and I noticed a fire extinguisher. And so I was like, you know, Dad, that would have been great to know that was there. And I was like, Dad, did, did you know that was there? And he's like, I forgot about that. I forgot that was there. And sometimes I think that's how we treat our faith is, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we think we're set. You know, we've been baptized. We, we trust in God. We believe in God. You know, we're doing all these right things, but we're kind of hiding our faith away. And, right, and just like that uh, fire extinguisher, we put it away in the closet and hope we never have to use it. And maybe we hope we never have to use our faith. And so, you know, a fire extinguisher is something we hope we never have to use. And... You know, our faith is sometimes not what we're reaching for in the beginning. It's something, like she said, they were trained to do this. This is something they over and over and over trained themselves to do. They were in God's word. They were thinking. They were praying. Um, and so it's kind of a weird time as a Christian in 2023 in this modern society. Things are a little bit different than it was for these three friends, right? It, you can still be cool in today's society and be a Christian, right? Back then, it was probably a lot different. So in today's society, kind of the question is, if you have faith you don't use, do you really have a faith? 
And so for the, the big question for chapter 3, and I'd like to get your input on, is what does real faith look like in 2023 for us, right, on a daily basis? What, what does that look like to you? What do you practice in your daily life to keep up on that? I'm curious to see what you all have to say. I think that's really good. I know from a personal perspective, you know, when you create a habit, just reading your Bible or praying in the morning or in the evening, I, I know I just feel like a different guy whenever I go weeks and weeks doing that, and then I skip one day of maybe reading my Bible or not praying. You know, I can tell there's a difference in my life. Um, and, and, and it's just that habit, that habitual habit of being in God's Word and praying and, like he said, making it a habit to do that. Anybody else? You first, then Morgan. And that's hard, right? Something you have to yeah. prepare for, think about, really and pray about. So, Morgan? Um, what was the question about? Really cool. Yeah, just the things we do throughout our life to kind of prepare ourselves for those moments. Nick, do you have your hand up? Seems like the, the king here sort of had a yes and mentality because, you know, there could be some arrows in the book, but in this chapter, it seems like the worship of the king when the music plays was an additional thing that he wanted the Jews to do and not something where they had to forsake. I like that.
that yes and in Todd's. That's a good way to put it. Thank you. Anybody else? Any initial thoughts for that? All right, we'll go into point number one here, which I call the demand by the king. We already kind of touched on that, but uh, the king here is he's demanding worship, right? And so at this point, the Babylonian Empire had conquered many nations by this point. And so the individuals who lived here, it wasn't just Babylonians. It was many different nations kind of compiled together. It was a little bit of a melting pot, right? Because they were going and conquering different things and pulling people in like Daniel and his friends. And so at this point, if I'm putting myself in the king's shoes, I'm probably thinking, how do I know who is really loyal? You know, and the king makes it clear, this isn't optional. You're going to die if you don't comply. And so it's a, it's a clear test of allegiance to all of these uh, new people within his nation. And so the king simply wants to see where his people have their faith. Does it lie with the king and his idols, or does it lie with your gods? And I think we can apply that to ourselves today, where does our allegiance lie with the world? Or maybe just God and a little bit of the world, like Nick was saying? Or is it just God? And so um, I know in the last several years, we've been seeing things like this in our world. And while I was studying through this, I came across a few articles just about um, in professional sports and world and religion and things like that. And I know Ryan and I were talking about this, but we've seen things like Pride Night at professional sporting events and um, athletes uh, trying to make a stand about something like that, you know, saying, no, I won't wear that jersey, that Pride Night jersey or that Pride Night patch. Um, and then being cut from the team. And so I was reading a recent article from uh, June of this year where we saw a Toronto Blue Jays pitcher, Anthony Bass, express that on Instagram with a video that he would not be supporting stores uh, like Target anymore as he did not believe in what they were supporting. And Bass stated, I quote, here's the reason biblically why I believe Christians have to be boycotting Target, Bud Light, and any other corporation that is pushing the things they're pushing. He says this is evil, demonic, and we just won't stand for it. We're not going to the stores anymore, and we're not going to give you our money. So this is just a guy on Instagram exp uh, expressing his biblical views for something. And so uh, the next day, of course, the Blue Jays, you know, doing damage control, uh, spoke out stating that these statements are not representative of the club's beliefs. And so um, interestingly enough, after the Blue Jays come out against his statements, Baston comes out and apologizes for his comments stating that he is working on a better educating himself. And so um, the Blue Jays then cut Bass one month later after a statement due to performance issues and not due to the pitcher's off-the-field circumstances. Um, and this move to cut him came hours before the Blue Jays' first game of Pride Weekend when the team faced the Minnesota Twins. He was actually expected to take part in the festivities, including catching the ceremonial first pitch. And so we see that similar to the days of Daniel and his friends, today we still have issues of faith versus cultural events, right? And so, you know, we've heard of the famous Colorado baker who refused to make a cake, right? That went to court and everything. So, like she said, we're, we're under fire, right? And there's things in the future we have to be looking forward, uh, forward to and be preparing for. And so, any comments about kind of around that? Any examples in our world today? Any examples in your job today? Maybe where you've been asked to do something you're not comfortable with and um, maybe a demand that as a Christian you would view as wrong. That's a great point. You know, I was reading something about Bass and his statement 
Although he came out and apologized for his comments, stating that he better should better educate himself. I'm not saying I agree with what he did there, but um, just if I were to put myself in his shoes, just think about once you kind of say things like that in a public fashion, you have to be ready to defend it. Because who knows what came to him in the mail? Who knows what death threats he got? Who knows who emailed him what thing? You know, who knows what the club said to him? So I'm sure that's a hard position to be in, but you have to be ready for those, like he said. Um, any other comments about things in our world, Morgan? That's cool he brought that up. That's a big deal in a corporate setting. You know, it, it encourages others to bring it up. Yeah, I believe that uh, that pitcher you referred to, Bass, he got booed by his own fans mm -hmm. when he got into the game, which to me is <clears throat> one of the most telling things. Extraordinarily, like, here's your home time. You play for this team, and your own fans are booing you over this issue. Yeah. And maybe that precipitated uh, some of the apology, but kind of to the corporate points like Kevin and, and Chad are making, I used to work at Panera. And I've been a recruiter just about my entire professional life. And when you're a recruiter, you're in HR. And when you're in HR, you're the sharp end of the stick when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and 
Pride and all this stuff. And my first year there was the first year they sponsored the St. Louis Pride Parade. And their presence grew in that, and I think they're still a part of that and all. And that came with the $10 t-shirt that you were encouraged to buy. You know, uh, Panera, Escort, Pride, whatever the saying was. Well, over the years, I started to stand out because I was one of the few people, because I sat in the HR department, that did not have one of these shirts. And a lot of these people would wear these shirts multiple times a week and that kind of stuff. And I didn't even really, I never got into a conversation. I never really said anything about, you know, my walk and that kind of thing. But it was clear what people thought. You know, after a while, people do kind of figure you out whether you're vociferous or not. Mm -hmm. And you really, I really felt the eyes on all that. And I can't imagine this picture. I can't imagine Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo. But at the same time, I think you're making a tremendous point tonight. It's about preparation, even if it's years in advance. Um, and I think, to Morgan's point, children, this Generation Z, whatever we want to call it, they are bearing the sharp end of the stick if anybody is. And it's up to us, because you can't expect teachers, you can't expect HR administrators, you can't always expect a rare CEO like Chad's talking about to really put his faith out there or even have that faith in the first place. I've never come across that in all my career. So it's up to us, for our children, other children, and the people they mix with to stand up and bear the brunt and say, I might lose my job over this. I might lose a lot of money, a lot of livelihood, a lot of savings, who knows what. Um, so I just, uh, I just can't imagine being booed by my own fans. Yeah. Yeah. Did anyone come, ever come up to you and question you about that? No, nobody ever did. But then COVID hit, and the restaurant industry got nailed, and a lot of people ended up leaving the organization, and yeah. so on and so forth. But uh, no, I never, I never got hit up for that. But I, I think if I'd gone on longer, I probably would. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I love, I love that point. Let's uh, push on here. I'm going to go to number two, the test. Um, kind of like what some of you were talking about. Similar in today's world, you know, it doesn't mean, really matter what side you're on. There's always someone, kind of a high-ranking authority, uh, that doesn't give in to a certain agenda. Someone sees that, they call it out. And that's kind of what's happening here with the three friends, right? They're being called out for going against the status quo. And something I thought was kind of interesting was, King Nebuchadnezzar kind of gives them a second chance. So I kind of wanted to put myself in the king's shoes here. You know, imagine seeing the three friends who you just promoted, right, along with Daniel, who you just promoted. You kind of have respect for them at this point, and they aren't bowing to this idol that you have, that you have set up. And so it was probably kind of a kick in the gut to him because he's like, well, I respect these guys. I just promoted them. This is making me look bad in front of everyone. 
So he's literally in front of all of Babylon with this. Uh, and he probably doesn't want to kill these men, especially since they're best friends with Daniel, who just interpreted his dream. But, you know, he has to exercise some strength to risk looking weak. And so um, point number three here is the decision. So the three friends had a decision to make. And they were unwavering in their choice and their faith in God. And I really love verses 16 through 18, where they say, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But I really love verse 18. I love this part. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I love that but if not in verse 18, because the three friends show they have a great understanding and appreciation of submission to God. They knew God's power, but they also knew that they must do what was right, even if God did not do what they expect or hope he will do. And I think that can apply a lot to our, especially our prayer lives. Sometimes we get kind of frustrated, or I know I do in, in my prayer life. I feel like maybe my prayers aren't being answered or something like that. But I think it's important to pray like the Bible says, without ceasing, knowing that God has the power, right? And I just, I just think that seems like a healthy balance, knowing that God has the power to answer them, but that maybe he doesn't. And so, um, just a question to think about. So, if today we reacted to persecution like they did, what message do we think this sends to the world and non-believers? That's a great point. Nick? We have this command in the New Testament to submit to the governing authorities. I think this story is a great example of that because to submit to the authorities of us doesn't mean to just blindly go along with what we're told to do. It means live your life as a Christian. But in that circumstance, when the governing authorities want to bind you and throw you in the fire, they don't fight back. There's no grand revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a, uh, a quote about that in here um, by someone basically saying, that's the best feeling ever, knowing that Christ is with you in the fire, right? You can always rely upon him. And so did I see any other hands? That's a great point. Yeah, rather than just being the lone ranger, taking it on yourself, we have everyone here to kind of rely upon and help us. Just for clarification, um, I can't seem to find where the Bible says that was Jesus in the furnace. Uh, the king himself said it was an angel, but maybe you could direct me to where people are convinced that that was Jesus in the 
Yeah, I think some translations might have it different. I think he said it was like, the, like a son of God or something uh, with that verbiage. I would have to look for the verse. But I know if anyone has that verse handy. It's verse 25. 25, perfect. He said, he answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. And, and I looked into that. There's, there's a lot of different commentators that think different things, right? Some say it's definitely Jesus who is in there with them. Some say it was an angel. But regardless, God was with them in that moment. Um, I think it's the important point to draw from that. But maybe we missed out. Very good point. Thank you. Let's see another hand. Okay. We'll go into number four. I'm going to look at the time here. We've got one minute. So we won't go into number four. <laughs> I appreciate everyone's comments tonight. So we'll adjourn there. Thank you.